Hi. Uh, so yeah, so our show, Brains On, um, our main thing that we do is we take questions from our audience and we answer them. So every episode we do, we choose from a giant document we have from all the questions kids have sent to us from around the world. We have like 3,500 questions we've gathered so far, so we have our work cut out for us. Um, and so we do everything from, you know, we just did an episode about dinosaurs, electricity, health, just whatever's on the kids' minds, which is basically everything in the world. Um, and then we answer them in fun and creative ways. And I host the show, but then every episode also has a kid co-host. So the kid is often a kid who sent in the question uh, to begin with. And as part of it, the kid will interview a scientist or someone who can help us answer the question. And we also do things like skitsplanations, we call them, where we kind of like do fun radio plays, where we like anthropomorphize molecules, um, or we'll have songs. Um, so we kind of try to make it fun so kids will like to listen to it. And our target age range is elementary students. So why do you think the Brains on Co podcast has been able to resonate with kids and adults? <laughs> is there one up there? Um, so yeah, so I think a lot of it is because it, we do listen to the kids and take every idea from them. We also include them in the shows in any way we can. So we'll do call outs, ask them for things like, are you a morning person or a night person? And tell us why. Or, you know... Um, just have mystery sounds they send to us. We make the show as interactive as possible. Um, and we speak to them, you know, in language they understand. And also I think part of it too is the three of us working on it, we're all really interested in science and have taken science classes in our lives, but we don't have science backgrounds. So we're sort of at the same level as the kids. And so we're all exploring and being curious together. Well, that's a perfect segue into this next question that I have. Is Why is it even important, do you think, to communicate science to kids and adults to the public in general, rather than just sort of telling them what they need to know? Why is it important to explain? I think uh, whatever we can do to encourage people to be curious uh, about the world is a very good thing, and to give them the tools they need to understand the world, um, to look critically at information, um, to know where to go to find information on their own, because a lot of times, you can't rely just for the thing that you need to come up naturally in the TV news or the newspaper or the radio. So just how to be a good advocate for yourself to find the information you need. So to encourage curiosity, to model question asking um, is an important thing, I think. Um, something that I think is really cool about your podcast is that I think you are able to take really complex subjects and make them so kids can understand. Um, so how do you how do you do that? Um, and what's been I think to your head like maybe one of the most difficult topics that you've had to really digest and figure out how are we going to get this kids to understand it? So so yeah so uh, the way we do that since we don't have science backgrounds is is we kind of pick our topics blindly, which is probably a good thing because we might not do them otherwise. Um, so we'll pick the topics that we think sound interesting, and then we'll go research them and go, oh no. That's hard. Um, so like one of the first really hard ones we did was like how does paint stick to the wall, which is like turns out to be incredibly complicated. You probably all knew that, but it is. Um, so we had to discuss molecular bonds. So like I spent an hour talking with a scientist to be like, okay, explain it to me. And then I'd repeat it back to him and he'd be like, no, that's not exactly right. And then I'd repeat it back to him. And we just did that for like an hour. And then we ended up writing a skit where there was a molecule party and we had like these different groups of molecules showing all the different kinds of molecular bonds. And that took a really long time to do. Um, and like recently we did one about why the ocean is salty, which like you think would have a really straightforward answer, but it doesn't. Um, and the woman we interviewed was like, oh, this is what I teach in my graduate level chemistry class. And I was like, cool, we're gonna do it anyway. Um, and we wrote a song about it. So, um, so it's really just like talking and asking the very basic questions um, to kind of get to the core of what it is that you need to know because there's a lot of maybe detail that you don't really need to include in the explanation. It's sort of like what is the basic stuff and because we kind of have to decide for every question where we draw the line because really every answer at a certain point will get back to molecules. So we have to decide like where to, to stop so not every answer is just molecules. 
So it sounds as though your process, and I believe that this probably should be our process too, is to find someone like you um, and just talk about it over and over and over and figure out how do we say it that makes sense, but then also is not too much and not too little. Um, so we might need to find some normal, regular people out there. Okay, so, so that being said, the next question we were going to ask was about the guidance that you give to the experts that you have on your show um, before they speak so that they're not, you know, way up here. But it sounds like maybe the guidance you give them is the long conversation you've had ahead of time. But is there anything else? You know, there are some uh, experts who are great at this and they don't need any guidance and they just talk like they're talking to normal people. And I mean, a great thing is when we have the kid in the conversation, then it's very clear who their audience is and they'll sort of automatically modulate their language to talk to the kid, which is a great thing. I don't know if you read about this, but the National Health Department, I forget the exact name of it, in the UK recently enlisted some nine-year-olds to help them rewrite their brochures about hip replacements. So basically what they did, they gave a presentation to a group of nine-year-olds about hip replacements, and then they had the nine-year-olds write their own pamphlets so then they took a lot of the language from the kids and made that was the new pamphlet. So it was like, your hip's old and rotten. You need to replace it. Here's what you can't eat before surgery, Coke and chocolate, you know. But it was like all the information you needed to know, but it was through the lens of the kids. Um, so yeah, so when we talk to the experts, some people are great at it and need no guidance. Some people really have trouble even when the kid is in front of them of, you know, kind of stripping away the jargon. Like when I was listening to you guys talk just now, it sounded really interesting, but I am not really sure what a lot of you are talking about. Um, so I think what, because when you're talking to yourself and your peers, we, we do it too in radio. Um, you know, we actually have a, a fellow working with us right now who is a PhD student in evolutionary biology, and he'll stop us and say, what are you talking about? Because we're using like radio producer jargon. So every field has their own jargon. So if you can sort of, get people to step out of the jargon, sort of say, you know, ask for metaphors, ask for, and sort of change the way you're asking the question. So like, don't ask it, because I think a lot of times reporters will want to you know, show how smart they are, and so they'll try to maybe use jargon in their question or say it in kind of a fancy way, but if you can say like, what about this like blows your mind, you know, and sort of force people to step out of their jargon comfort zone a little bit and talk like they would if they're at a bar talking to their friend about their day at work or something. Um, you've touched on this before, and we're going to dig deeper um, about where to, where to draw that line. Um, I know you, can, you deal with it, I'm sure, all the time with the scientists, and we are no different. We want to tell you every single detail because it's very important. <laughs> um, but where, how do you help the scientists draw the line, and how do you make the decision when you're trying to put together a show of like, okay, we don't need to go down to molecules. Like, this, this is our message. So how, what is that process like? Um, yeah, so I think a lot of it is just having conversations. We kind of want all the detail up front, if possible, just to sort of, some of it's super interesting. I mean, it's all super interesting, but not all of it's necessary. So, I mean, I want to learn as much as humanly possible as you can in like a 45 minute conversation with someone without, you know, studying it. Um, and then sort of decide where that line is and sort of, um, Talking to multiple experts is also a good thing, especially when there might be some not agreement. Like uh, we found out when we were trying to explain how airplanes fly, there's like not actually agreement on how airplanes fly, which you think there would be, but there's not. So I mean, so they know like how they fly and how to make them fly, but sort of this idea of like what exactly is happening in physics that allows that to happen is a, a subject of debate. So. Um, talking to multiple people is always a good thing, too. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so we've talked about how do you choose your message, but then the type of message that you use. Um, we've been thinking, especially in this collaborative, we've been thinking a lot about telling stories. We've been asking, we've been collecting stories from professionals in this group, from um, other folks, uh, animal producers, um, other public health experts, regular people, moms dads, um, because we're thinking that with something that's so complex, telling people stories might be a good way to go about it. And so how do you think storytelling works into science? And do you use that in your podcast? I think storytelling is hugely important for 
resonating with people. We don't do a lot of storytelling in our podcast because we focus more on um, sort of the like element elementary stuff that sort of answers these questions. Sometimes we'll get to stories and answering them, but a lot of times it's more just like, how does this thing work or why is it that way? Um, one example though that we did have stories, we did an episode about explaining what Down syndrome is and we talked to um, the kid who sent us the question from Vermont and his two friends who have Down syndrome and so we talked to them about what it's like to be friends and then we had our co-host who had Down syndrome and her brother and we talked to them about living together and I think that was a particularly powerful episode because you could hear their personal stories. So I think personal stories are always great but I also think you do need to balance that with like explaining sort of the how behind the personal story because I think if you can explain the basics of the science behind it, that that is a good thing for people to understand why you're telling them to do what you're asking them to do in addition to the personal stories. Great, that's really helpful. And so what, what do you think the audio does for you? Like that platform is, well, I guess now you just got a National Science Foundation <laughs> grant to study this, so maybe you don't have all the answers. But I assume you wrote a proposal and have some ideas. Um, so what is it about the audio platform and hearing people that is important for translating science? Uh, well, I think audi audio is a very intimate medium um, because it kind of feels like the person is talking directly to you. Um, it's a very kind of personal relationship with the host or the scientist. Um, and I actually read a study recently about how we are able to detect emotion almost better through hearing someone talk than in watching them. Like we're just really good, humans are at detecting emotion in voices. So I think there's something about just hearing someone talk in your ear that makes you connect with it. It also engages the imagination in a way that watching things doesn't. It's sort of the same as reading where you're forced to paint a picture of what's happening. So it's a, almost like more active than watching TV, which is a very passive way of consuming information. Um, and I think to when you don't have sort of the crutch of showing a visual aid, it forces you to sort of come up with elaborate metaphors or these sort of very sticky ways of pre presenting information because you can't rely on just showing like a diagram of what a thing looks like. So I think that's why audio is effective. Um, do you have experience in communicating with different media types and is there anything that would apply to apply to both, to written or visual communication that works well in audio and it would work well in other media. Um, yeah, my work in the newsroom, we made some videos to also explain things. That's clearly like what I like doing, I guess, is explaining things. Um, so when we were making videos, we had to have a very strong reason of why it was a video and not an audio story, because we are newsrooms, a radio newsroom. So. Um, in that case, we really wanted strong visual metaphors to sort of describe things. So these were, again, sort of explaining abstract things like the voter ID amendment or uh, property taxes. Um, so in that case, like the moving picture helped us do those things. So I think if you, if you have a strong reason to use a visual aid that you really can't do in another way, then you should do it. But if, you, if there are ways to not use the visual aid and sort of tell a story or paint a, an elaborate word picture, you know, that's always a good thing to try. And your podcast is great because it's entertaining as well as informative. And so thinking about that concept of communication plus entertainment equals success, um, how, how do you factor in the entertainment piece into your, um, your decision to either choose a story or how you communicate it on the podcast or in the newsroom? Um, well, so for the podcast, you know, our, our target audience is kids, and we take kids very seriously, and we take their curiosity very seriously, um, and we see them as, you know, kind of equal participants in the making of the show. Um, but we also take their goofiness incredibly seriously, and so we want to be goofy and silly to whenever possible, as long as the topic is not one where that would be totally inappropriate. Um, and so that's sort of, we, we sort of try to think of the ways we can do that, and we look for people, scientists we can talk to who are game for sort of being a little goofy um, and having fun with us and our guests. Um, and then in the newsroom, there was less, you know, you're not worried about entertainment value in the same way, um, but the videos we made, we were looking to be um, entertaining with those videos and that we wanted them to look good and interesting. And we didn't have high budget, so we sort of, like, 
leaned into the fact that they were sort of handmade looking and so we had kind of like kid-like music playing in the background and did a lot of like stop motion stuff. So you can do those things without, you know, a lot of technical know-how or, um, you know, background and special effects. You can do it sort of in a low fi way as long as it's with purpose. So I think it's like, what would you want to watch? What would you want to listen to is always a good question to ask yourself. And if you wouldn't want to read or listen to it, then maybe you should change something about it to make it <laughs> what you would want to read or listen to. Um, so the group here today is talking about One Health, which is you know looking at things from a human, animal, environmental component. Um, how often in your show do you get into a topic and realize, oh, this isn't about the environment, this is about people? Or do you, do you, do you find that often more than one concept are involved? I'd say probably every topic is like that because we sort of start in this place and we often kind of go off on tangents. I mean, a lot of it comes back to humans and the environment. Um, so I think most things you can kind of connect back to us, especially because a lot of these questions are from kids and they're looking around them at, you know, around them at the world and that's where their questions are coming from. So, Over the course of your career, have you do you notice that there's more of an interest in that, that there's more of a sort of a, a market for listeners to learn about how we're all connected, um, particularly with things like climate change happening and, you know, whatever it might be? Are people more interested in learning about how we're all connected? And can we use that to our advantage? I don't know. I'm not sure. Because uh, I don't think people necessarily think about it in that way of, you know, how am I connected to everybody else? I think, you know, there's a lot of divides right now and I think people are interested in bridging divides. Um, and I think people who think about climate change and science kind of know that all of these things are connected and want to know about how they're connected. And I think it's, and I think there's a real thirst for knowledge about certain topics right now that a lot of your work could play into for sure. Uh, I'm curious to know what the kids are thinking about. Um, because you said you had a huge database of questions. Um, whether you've done already done the show or not, I'm sure you like still get repeat questions. What what are like themes of questions that kids are submitting lately? Um, well, so we get a lot of things about uh, what was the first. So like, what was the first robot? What was the first um, you know medicine? Those kind of things. What, how was this thing invented? We also get a lot of questions about sort of like big universe questions, like. What is the edge of the universe? What's on the other side of a black hole? How does gravity exist? What if there was no time? Like all of these sort of like big <laughs> questions and you're like, whoa, that's amazing. And we, we've done a couple episodes like that and they're always super fun. Um, and then there's always a lot of questions about clearly things that are happening in their life. Like how do you catch a cold? Why do you have to wear sunscreen? You know, why do I have to eat this food that my mom's telling me to eat? And why can't I only eat candy? You know, so it's like, very clearly, like, from their experience. Um, there's a lot of questions about animals, a lot of questions about electricity, like charging devices and uh, where, how birds can sit on wires. You know, it's just, there's a lot of, it's like a kid will just look at the world and be like, question, 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 um, and send them to us, and it's really fun. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so either as, oh, you, you know, we're here because we all are, you know, working on the problem of antibiotic resistance and the way that we're trying to improve that problem is by improving how we use antibiotics. And so just either as a, a, a citizen, as a uh, newsroom worker, as a podcast maker, um, is the problem of antibiotic resistance in this concept that antibiotic use needs to be improved, does that come into play in any of those sectors of your life? And as someone who um, you know, thinks about a lot of things in a lot of depth. You know, what what are your thoughts on it, just for for the group? Um, I mean, I've read several articles about superbugs, and they terrify me. And I'm like, I'm just hoping smart people are working on this somewhere because it's totally out of my control. So I'm glad to know you all exist. Um, and you know, I have a two year old, so I go to the pediatrician, and my pediatrician is very cautious about antibiotics. You know, she, my daughter had an ear infection, but she gave us a prescription, but was like, don't fill it. I would like you to wait like two days. And if it's not better, then you can fill it. But otherwise, like, don't do it. And so we didn't, and she was fine. Um, so I have that in my personal life. And then also, you know, I think 
I've sort of like the personal stories you're talking about, like the comedian Tig Notaro who had C. diff, her story, <laughs> I remember it very vividly. Um, and I think about that a lot when I'm thinking about antibiotics. So sort of having those personal stories, also the news articles, also the personal experience, I think like all those things come together to make me, me very aware of the topic and I'm interested in it. And I think when we hear from kids, you hear things about like germs and you hear things about medicine and you hear things about hand sanitizer um, and you're hearing about all these different things. And so I think it's, it's in their minds, but I don't think they necessarily have heard about antibiotics a lot or superbugs or things like that, antibiotic resistance. So I think there could be more done to sort of get the message out to younger people. Um, what questions do you have about antibiotic use in healthcare, animal care, environmental impact? It's kind of a big question that you've been here 20 minutes. <laughs> Probably all the questions. Uh, I, I, when you're talking about that footprint, I was like, what is that? I would like to know more what that means because it sounded intriguing. I mean, really, everything you guys talked about, I was like, what is that? Tell me more. So I think there's a lot that I don't know and would like to know more about. Um, I think also, too, sort of like in the community level, I'm curious about how, you know, decisions made by one doctor sort of ripple out into the rest of the community um, and things like, I, I just think there's a lot of maybe misinformation or not clear information about hand sanitizer and antibacterial soaps and like, which are, what are you supposed to do when you wash your hands? You know, when I take my kid to the playground, what should I do afterwards? Should I just let her lick her hands or should I like wash them <laughs> really well, hand sanitize them? What do I do? Um, so I think there's sort of like those very basic questions that I need answered. Yeah, super. Well, actually, no, I, we can even talk now. So the next step of this is to sort of open it up for our collaborative to talk about communication, because we've all identified we want to better engage the public. And while we have you here, um, we can open up that conversation. People can ask questions, and we can share ideas about what we think um, we might want to do over the coming year, and just have a overall chit-chat. So one thing that I'll just bring up that we um, were at the state fair this year. We had a booth, um, the antibiotic stewardship, what were we? The antibiotic experts booth um, in the Eco Experience building, right next to what not to flush, which was very important to know. And I hope everyone looked at the what not to flush because one of the things not to flush is pharmaceuticals. Yes. Um, anyway, where was I going with that? Yes. So. <coughs> A lot of the people in this room volunteered, and after the volunteering, we got feedback from the volunteers. What were the most common questions asked? What were the things that you needed in addition to a chair, um, which was not at the booth at the beginning? Um, and one of the most common questions asked by the public was about hand sanitizer, interestingly. So I think that, that our experience at the state fair, talking to thousands of people, um, was helpful to us to hear what do people want to know. Um, and so next year, or on our website, or maybe on our One Health Stewardship Collaborative podcast, um, we could address some of those things. So just to bring that up, that, that's the type of thing that we're hearing. Um, and so we, that's one task that we'll have over the coming year to think about how do we communicate with folks about hand sanitizer. <gasps> A hand! Great. We're supposed to have two microphones. Oh, OK. Oh, this is it. We can. Well, we can talk very loudly. You can use that one. We'll talk loud. I can shout. I got a good shouting voice. Yeah. I'm good. And then you can keep it. That's fine. Because it's more important than the answer. So piggybacking on Amanda's comment about the state fair, one thing I've been thinking about in this is, you know, Bill and I worked it together, and we're both environmental chemists. And there were questions we got that were clearly outside our expertise. Like, my daughter has this rash. Should it be treated with an antibiotic? We're like, wrong kind of doctor, lady. <laughs> yeah. it was, and it was, worse, it was worse than that. It's like, my daughter has this rash. I'm afraid of antibiotics because right. of everything I've heard. Right. I don't want to go to the doctor. Right. Like, go to the <laughs> go doctor. To the doctor. <laughs> but anyway, my, my question is, and this doesn't necessarily apply to the podcast because there you have a self-contained nugget of information where you're controlling you know, the dialogue. But in radio, I'm guessing you have other situations where this is relevant. I don't know where to, when somebody's coming and looking at me as an expert, I don't know where to define the limit of that. You know, Almost certainly I know more information than the person who's asking the question but I'm reluctant to go very far outside my comfort zone. And I know I probably need to go farther than I do, 
before deferring, um, but I'd just love some strategies for kind of where do we answer the question, where do we say, I don't know, I can get back to you, or where do we punt completely? And that's, I struggled with that at the State Fair on certain questions, and I'm sure I will in the future, too. You should just look for people's eyes to yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, for, for that situation, I mean, I think it would be, I don't know what, what you had at the booth, but sort of like prepared ideas. So if you are environmental chemists from ag, you know, experts or pediatricians so you can be prepared to answer those questions. Because I think the person coming to the booth does see you as the expert, even if, you know, that's not your area of expertise. You are the expert at the booth, so I feel like whoever's at the booth should be prepared to answer all the questions. And I also think it's okay to say, I don't know. Here's a resource that you can find the answer. So if there is a resource you can provide to people, like a pamphlet or a website or something, or maybe you guys can have like an iPad at your uh, booth where you can look stuff up and give them. Because I think coming from you, you are the expert, and so you have a nice sheen of expertness. And <laughs> it's good to, that, that person trusted you and wanted to hear what you had to say. So a specific question for you. So we did have a list of talking points that we put together, and it was so, for exactly this reason. Um, that, well, I mean, not about the rash, but for the reason that, you know, if someone asks you something general about antibiotic use in animal agriculture or in healthcare, then we had some talking points. But those talking points really were just looked at by folks like us. So perhaps for the coming year, we run the talking points by regular people. Um, we also see, are there questions on here that we haven't included? Um, so do you think that might be a good... Yeah, yeah, I also think giving people to like the tools to find their own information because I think you know on the internet there's a lot of bad information and not everyone is good at knowing which are the reputable sites and who you can trust. So if there are things you can do at your booth that sort of give people the tools, so even if you don't know the question, you can say, "I don't know, but let's consult the iPad and this is a really good website you can go to in the future if you have questions. Please go to this website. And not this other one. Go to this website to find answers to your questions." You're a communication expert, um, and I just want to know your opinion on this. Uh, what I struggle with oftentimes in my job, and I saw frequently at the booth as well, is that I would do my very best to communicate in what I thought was a straightforward way, and maybe that was the problem, but I can't control what they hear. And how do you reconcile, or what tips do you know to actually make sure that they're hearing what is the right message, or that they're not putting their own confirmation bias on it and taking around the total wrong message? Because I see that all the time in my profession, and I'm like, no, 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 that does not mean go and take some herbal supplement and you can <laughs> take this. But they extrapolate to something totally different. And so that's something I really struggle with. I mean, probably some of that is out of your control, and most people will do that no matter what. But I think when you're responding to someone to, like, especially in a booth situation, um, to talk in really short sentences. I mean, that's what we do on the radio, is we talk in really short sentences. Um, and it's a good thing. <laughs> because, you know, because I think, too, when you are an expert, you want to tell them all the things. But I think start uh, with the basics and keep it short. And then see if they have more questions about the basics you just told them. So sort of have it really be a dialogue rather than, and I don't know if you did this, but you know, rather than a monologue, it's sort of like, what can I do for this thing? Have you thought about this? Do you know about this? No, I don't know about this. Here's one fact about it. Do you want to know more? Okay, great, here's another fact about it. And sort of keep it going back and forth um, is probably a good place to start because then you can kind of to also control the flow of the conversation rather than speaking in paragraphs, and then the person's like, heard one, only one thing you said, and then we'll go off and sort of not remember actually the key point that you wanted them to take away from it. Shout, shout it. Shout okay, it. I'll shout and then you'll Okay, so one thing that you guys had just talked about with the hand sanitizer. I'm embarrassed that I don't know the answer if you're supposed to use hand sanitizer or not, but I'm just a farmer, so um, I'm feeling like it, and this is going to come full circle. We did these fact sheets in the ag group, and it's great information, but how do we get people to care about what's on the information? How do we drive people to the information? And do we break it down into a simple nugget on social media that is, should you use hand sanitizer? Here's the answer. Push it to them, just one little nugget at a time. And I'm curious with your podcast, how do you get people 
um, outside of regular listeners to the podcast to to drive them to your information. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good idea. Um, sort of break out the questions that you think people are most interested in and sort of Googleable. Um, and so we do that with our show, and we'll say, "Do you want to know why dinosaurs were so big? Listen to this episode." You know. Um, <laughs> And so we will do that a lot. And I think that's a smart idea to drive people there who might not seek it out on their own. I think that's an awesome idea, Karen. And it also would be potentially a way for us to source these questions. You know, I really like what you said about how, like, the kids are all, always have questions. And, you know, what, I think what we have done thus far is said, this is what we want people to know. Here's the information. But maybe it needs to be even more basic than that and be like, hey, what do you, what do you guys want to know? Do you know what an antibiotic is? You know, and especially if we're trying to target this younger population of like the children are the future. Um, I think that would be a really cool thing. Like maybe we could source questions from like our elementary, but there's plenty of us, I think, that have elementary school age you know, <coughs> kids that we could, and they have friends. And their moms. And their moms, yeah. yeah. Maybe their moms. And we could, we could source some questions so that we're a little bit more prepared next year at the fair to know how do we answer those questions. I don't think we're ever all going to be prepared for the rash question. <laughs> 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 but we could be more prepared. Sure. And, and I think one thing that we got out of the fair experience this year was that, you know, we had a lot of, there were adults that moved, a lot of them liked the poster, they would read it, and then they would have questions about it, so we sort of guided questions that way, but a lot of, I think there was a lot of adults that wanted to engage a little bit more, but couldn't because their kid was running off, mm -hmm. so we need to figure out a way to keep the kid at the booth, too. Do you need, like, a game or something? Yes. Yeah, we do that. But yeah, I think that's a really good idea. And it's always good to ask what people want to know who aren't in your circle. Because when we first started making our show, what we assumed the kids wanted to know about is before we started getting questions from the audience was just kind of wrong. Um, and then when we started getting questions from our audience, we were like, oh, they're like way more complicated and have way more nuanced questions than we thought. And the same thing when they interview the scientists, their questions are like way better than our questions. So um, asking the public is always really good. And it sounds like you did that kind of at the state fair, just not on purpose, but just by hearing what people were talking about. So it's like, I'm, it sounds awesome that you guys are at the State Fair. Yeah, come see us. I love the State Fair. Oh. <laughs> I wanted to flip things around on you. So we all know that scientists are bad at communicating. Not all of them. <laughs> but, uh, but another issue that we run across is that how media communicates science, right? And so chocolate is good for you, chocolate is bad for you, or the worst quote I've ever seen was Al Roker recently said, just find the study that tells you how you want to live your life and follow that one. Then. And so, you know, what advice do you give to other, what can the media do better? What advice do you have for people that are on the media side and working with the scientists? Yeah, I think um, a lot of the problem is that like news organizations only want to cover the new thing. And so for them, the new thing is the new study. And I don't think they often maybe have the tools to, to interpret the study. And then they're relying on a press release that's written in a certain way. And then they'll, maybe they'll interview the scientists. I mean, I think probably a lot of the articles you're seeing that are kind of bad probably never even talked to the scientists and probably just went from the press release. So, I mean, the good reporting that you'll see, like, from NPR and, like, more reputable organizations will be really good. And they'll talk to the scientists and it'll be more nuanced. But then a lot of times you won't see that. And that's a shame. But I think, like, the opportunity is to explain the things that are happening in the world that are science, but aren't necessarily news, you know, because it's not new, but it gets connected to something in the world. So, you know, there's health, new health things happening all the time, or like an outbreak or something. And there's a lot of opportunity there to explain things about infectious disease or how we treat diseases. Um, you know, and, and there are good investigative sort of reporting projects that do that and talk more deeply about things. But I think you're right. There are a lot of problems with the way science does appear in the media, for sure. Kind of related to what you just said, um, there are what we um, kind of refer to as gray areas, or there's some known unknowns, and then there are unknown unknowns, right? And sometimes I feel um, folks gravitate to certainty, right? So it's sometimes difficult to communicate that there are things that we really don't know about, mm -hmm. and 
how, my first question is, do you ever get follow-up comments or questions after the podcast about conflicting opinions or answers that the audience might have heard? So as an infectious disease specialist, like, I struggle with this, like, if, if somebody comes in and a urologist has said something about it, and that's a reputable urologist who's taking care of the patient and they care about it for a long time, and they trust them, right? Now, their knowledge about a certain aspect of a urinary tract infection may be limited, or we don't know, right? And now I tell them something different. It's very difficult for the kind of uh, the layperson to reconcile that. One of us is wrong, right? So how, in your opinion, how do we communicate that uncertainty to, to the listener, to the patient, to their family members, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I can tell you on our show that we have a lot of scientists saying, I don't know. Uh, especially because kids are asking them questions and a lot of the times the answer is, you know what, we don't know yet. We're working on it and here's some things we think maybe and here's the questions we're asking, but we just don't know. And and then they often encourage the kid, like, you could work on this as a grown-up and maybe you'll find the answer. Um, but I think when you're dealing with patients, I mean, I think that's way more complicated because you are hearing two conflicting things from two people that are in places of authority. So I think that's difficult. So I think whatever you can do to sort of like show your work you know, like you had to do in math class of like, so here's, this is sort of the information your doctor was working with. I have some new information or something, I'm not sure what's happening, but sort of like, here's how I got to this conclusion. So I think sort of not just asking people to just trust your sort of conclusion, but sort of saying like, here's how I got to my conclusion, I think would probably be helpful. And then you're seeing this in news organizations now with sort of the distrust in media, like the Washington Post has started doing explainers of how their reporters are doing their work, sort of what an anonymous source is and how you use them. And that's sort of next to their news stories now, which news organizations never used to do or have to do, but now they're doing it. So I think there's probably more today, you just have to show your work more. My question is kind of similar to Alicia's, um, and it sparked in my head when you said the kind of controversy of how exactly do airplanes fly, and I feel like we often present information that we think is like science-based, evidence-based, and everyone should believe it, but of course there's always the other side, and whether or not that's based on fact or fiction, how do you present messages in a way to an audience that you know may have a different opinion without you know, distracting from the truth, or even just from turning people off from your own message? So are you saying from things that might not be fact-based? Well, even or? if they are fact, like kind of maybe they're fact-based, maybe they're not. But just how do you present two opinions of uh, like that are controversially different, but trying to get one message forward? And I guess how do you present a message without offending your audience? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so we did an episode about sunscreen that I was very worried about um, because there is sort of a lot of bad information about sunscreen, and we decided to go sort of uh, the evidence-based route and talk to scientists about it, and because we're a science show, and that was what we did. Um, so I think, and a lot of you know things in politics, there are sort of this side or this side, but I think in science, there's, you know, there's evidence-based things, and then there's also, you know, I think if, if you can show the evidence for the thing you're talking about, if there's evidence for another thing, then I think you should say what the evidence for the other thing is, but if there's something that's just, opinion that doesn't have evidence behind it, I don't think you need to talk about it. I don't think you should feel that need if there's no good evidence there. What are the, the can you um, specify for sunscreen? Mm -hmm. So the yeah, evidence so there, are, but there's risks or something? Yeah, so there, I'm, so there were sort of a few studies in mice that showed if they ate a lot of sunscreen, <laughs> it caused cancer. And they, you know, they ingested a lot of it, more than you would ever ingest wearing sunscreen. You know? And so we talked to dermatologists and experts about, so you know, we asked about the specific studies that people were citing, you know, what, and they explained why you know, it's an interesting study, but probably not um, sort of applicable for talking about sunscreen use. But on the other hand, the benefits of sunscreen. But on the other hand, I mean, it's, you will protect you. So, looking at the evidence that the experts have gathered. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of just general distrust in experts these days. Yeah. And so people are comfortable saying, well, I found this website that said sunscreen will give me cancer, without actually like looking at where that website is getting their information from. So it's like a distrust in experts, but a trust in 
something else and just you know kind of finding like what you're saying like Al Roker said like finding the study that sort of agrees with what you feel already that's I think that's that seems really applicable to a lot of folks in this room for sure I, I was gonna say along that line too do you think that some of it has to come along the lines of not understanding basic science because you know, we all have to do a little bit of self-regulatory. You know, we as a scientist must say, you know, I'm full of hot water, you're full of hot water. But yet when you approach somebody, you say, all right, I'm having a conversation with you. I'm ignorant in your area of expertise and you're ignorant in my ex you know, area of expertise, but we're not both stupid. You know, I need to learn something. So people not understanding the basic principle of science that was sort of driven home to me is that, there, you, you, you choose a hypothesis, you know, your hypothesis testing when you're in basic science. You never prove a hypothesis, and that's one of the first things we try to get up there and say, well, this proves, and it doesn't. You know, what you do is you gather data, you gather information that suggests the probability that this is correct. That's too hard to explain to a nine-year-old or a four-year-old or my grandmother kind of thing. So getting that information shifted over into saying an understanding of how science also evolves with time. What we knew to be true 50 years ago as being the best process for treating something, whether it's in the environment or human medicine, you know, we're much more advanced in that now. So it's, it's getting down to that core understanding of science and also separating promotion. Um, you know, the publish or perish in the university, um, even in the medical field, you know, if I'm not getting the right prescription, if I'm not getting the antibiotic from my doctor, my doctor's really lousy, mm -hmm. you know, which is not true, you know, so you try and convey that science is changing, you know, we're learning new information, it's not stagnant, mm -hmm. thank goodness it's not stagnant, you know, so, you know, trying to get that core foundation. Yeah, it's really, it's really important. important, I mean, we've been doing actually a lot of history of science on our show lately, and it just sort of happened naturally, like we did an episode about plate tectonics, and we did a long piece about how that came to be accepted science, which is really relatively recently, like in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of tracing that, like how this person floated this idea a long time ago and people sort of dismissed it, but then this evidence came up. So we sort of, we went through that process in our show. Um, and, you know, we've also talked to scientists, you know, we're talking about, we did a, a series on electricity and sort of the first people who found electric, you know, static electricity thought maybe it was magnetism and sort of looking at how these things changed over time and how, you know, we might scoff at those people, but people might scoff at us in, you know, 200 years for the things we believe are true and safe. And so I think showing that it's okay for ideas to change as long as you have reasons for those ideas changing. So again, showing your work of how you came to that conclusion, what sources you're looking at that make you believe what you believe. I was curious to know, is there any topic you've avoided um, because you thought there'd be too much controversy, or are you guys just going to go, you're going to go straight? Okay. Um, that's good. No, that's fantastic. And you said science-based, and I, I, I agree. I think everybody in this room agrees. Um, but, I mean, even even knowing all that and what you've said, do you at all change your message? And going back to, you know, your sunscreen episode where you, you were worried about it, and, and so thinking about that one and other ones, um, how do you, is there anything beyond just going fact-based um, to communicate to your audience? Because, um, I mean, we know in our field, of, you know, the health department, if we post anything vaccine or about measles, like, you're going you're gonna to get the comments. Um, with our group, you know, the, in, in a common world right now, antibiotic use in animals is, is not good to the common person. Um, you know, antibiotics and, you know, are bad. So, but in our group, we, we don't, we don't feel that way. We feel like sick animals should be treated and that's like really, it's controversial. So, you know, what is a way to approach those topics like at the state fair when you get that heated person when maybe fact based isn't enough? I really, I really do, like, I think I'm just gonna repeat myself, but I really think the showing your work is important because you, you believe this thing and you're not going to change your view because of the person coming up to you at the state fair. So you're not going to say, okay, you're right. But I think if you can say, you think these things for this, maybe whatever reasons you have, 
And you could ask them what the reasons are. You could ask them, like, what are you looking at that's making you think this? And you can say, well, here's what we're looking at that's making us think this. Because I think showing the documents and the studies and whatever you have, and again, having the iPad there or something. So you can pull these things up for the people who really are skeptical. And because instead of just saying, I'm right and you're wrong, you, you can say, this is why we think this. And I think that's way more powerful to the skeptical people because then they still might believe what they believe, but at least they'll know where you're getting your information from and they can decide whether or not to trust it. Peter. But you got a, a really just oh. simple procedural question, you know, in relation to the shoot from the hip at the state fair with what you've got. <laughs> how many different people and how many person hours go into answering one of the questions? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so, you know, some of the podcasts we do a bunch of questions in one episode. Um, it's sort of hard to know because there's three of us working on it and we sort of start working on them like months in advance. So, um, you know, it's a lot of time. Uh, but it's also highly produced, and you know we do like audio play, and then we interview people, and um, so it's many hours. You know, probably I don't even know, forty hours or something. Because you know we per, oh, per, per episode, topic. and you know each episode answers multiple questions, so it's hard to say like per thing. I mean, if you were just writing these up, it would be much shorter than if we are producing a radio show. How do the children and millennials learn about your show if there's nobody in their family who listens to NPR? Mm -hmm. What platforms do you uh, Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so our show is for elementary students, uh, basically. Um, and at that point, the, we find that listening is mediated through the parent. So it's the parent who's the one who's saying, let's try this show in the car on the way to school or something. So we're reaching out to the parents rather than the kids directly. And there's also a lot of rules around how you interact with children on the internet. Um, so we reach out to parents, um, and then you know parents will email us on behalf of their kids. So like the kid will dictate an email to the parent, and the parent will email it to us. Um, so it's very there's a lot of parents involved because we're not targeting teenagers who would not be interested in something their parents suggested to them. Um, the elementary kids are still willing to do what their parents suggest. Okay, we have to maybe have our last two questions because we've got to. Get Molly on her way. Okay. So the common theme I'm hearing with all this is that it takes time to get the right messaging out, and yet we're always told that you have to have a sound bite and a simple, mm -hmm. simple message. So in that regard, I'm feeling very conflicted because if you really want to learn and get the messaging out correctly, both people have to be engaged in the time it takes to do that, mm -hmm. and yet. Most people in their day-to-day -day life, they just want the sound bite and that's all they're going to listen to. And so how do you really truly represent science, science fairly when clearly it's very complicated in so many nuanced ways, in a way that I think is fair? And I think to a certain extent that's what's been the downside to science is that we've tried to too simplify it and too sound bite it and so then it just creates a ton of controversy and confusion, I guess. I think that's super fair. I think it, um, you know, we were just in this um, series on electricity and we were hearing about the like traveling electricity shows that went around the country to show people that electricity was a real thing and the reason that lightning, you know, where lightning came from. And they, you know, Benjamin Franklin like literally traveled up and down the colonies showing people like exploding little houses to convince people. So, um, you know, you can't do that right now probably. Um, but I think it, it is really hard to find sort of the succinct answer you can give. I, I mean, I think being succinct and like I mean, sound bites sort of have a bad rap, I guess, but there's nothing wrong with being succinct. But that does take preparation ahead of time on the behalf of the experts to sort of say, how can I say this in a succinct way? What is the, how can I be prepared for the questions that I'm pretty sure people will ask me? Because I think being succinct is, is a good thing. You know, and I think everyone in every field is, has this problem. My husband's an artist, and I edit his grants for him. He like says, he uses 50 words where five will do. So, you know, just <laughs> editing yourself is a good thing for all of us. And like you had said, you know, if you want to know why dinosaurs are this big right. or were this big, you know, look over here. So, so I think, I mean, you want to include nuance, of course, but I think it's like you sort of have, you have to meet people where they are. So like start with a succinct answer. And then if they want more, then you're ready with more. But you have to have that like entry point of succinctness, and then you can go deeper. Last question. Joni. Oh, sorry. Joni, go ahead. Okay. 
Um, so even though I'm a grown up, I'm a huge fan of your show. <laughs> so, uh, but one thing I've taken away from your show that I'd like you to comment on is this idea that nuanced uh, understanding of issues comes from people who've been doing this for a very long time, come from people mm -hmm. and not from Dr. Google. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't ever say that, but you talk to people who really understand what they're saying and there's, there's very, almost never this, you know, go look at this website or this mm -hmm. website. It's like, go talk to people who know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And that's, you know, how we learn everything for our show. I mean, we'll often do like a cursory Google search to sort of get the basics under our belt before we talk to someone. And it's how we find most experts we talk to is through Google. So thank you, Google, for making that possible. Um, but I do think it is always better to talk to people and they'll answer your questions. And you might have a question for the website and the website won't answer it. It doesn't, doesn't respond when I talk to it, although Alexa might. Maybe she'll know. Um, but, you know, I think talking to people is always better. And I think, too, it's sort of that, like, media literacy is huge. Um, so whatever we can do, and I, I've heard this from teachers that we, you know, have heard from a lot, we talk to, that media literacy is like their number one thing of how to tell their students where to find good information and which websites are not good. Because it, it sounds to me, what they're saying about their students is they don't know the difference right now of what's trustworthy and what's not. So we do have one last question. Okay. Yeah. Steve, go ahead. So it kind of builds on your last, your one of your last comments about meeting people where they're at. I think it's, you know, sometimes we get, you know, I'll get blitzed with, why do you pump birds full of antibiotics and that type of thing? And, and I think one thing I've, I've learned over the years is if I go back to them and kind of find out where they're at or why they're asking that question, they say, well, I'm concerned about my kids getting, you know, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And I say, you know what, I've got a couple of, I've got a couple of boys as well, and so I'm concerned about that, and then here's how we do it. And then, and then like you said earlier, just kind of asking them, because uh, maybe that, that, answers the question that they had and they're okay with it versus sometimes when I've kind of blasted, oh, well, there's, you know, we talk about GMOs, it's, well, there's 2,000 studies out there that you know, this is not an issue, it's been used for 30 years. That doesn't go anywhere, but if I get a chance to kind of more relate to where they're at. And, and, uh, yeah. I think whatever you can do to keep it a conversation, not an adversarial thing, like I'm right, you're wrong, or vice versa, you know, connecting with people on a one-to-one -one level is huge if you can do that. That's great. Okay, well, thank you, Molly, so much for joining us.